Now, Trevor Potter is the president of the Campaign Legal Center, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., focused on the reform of money in politics, thank God. And he's also a member of Kaplan and Drysdale's Washington, D.C. office, where he leads the firm's political law practice. He's one of the country's best known and most experienced campaign and election lawyers and a former commissioner and chairman of the Federal Election Commission. I can go on, but again, I think you know Trevor. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Larry, for, uh, I, I think, pointing out the, the key, really, to this discussion, which is uh, I don't think any of us up here see uh, this as a debate bet with winners and losers between a constitutional option uh, and legislative options uh, or between various legislative options. Uh, when I uh, was talking to Larry about this, whatever it was now, a year and, year and a half ago, uh, I asked him to come to Washington and participate in a discussion about disclosure. And I said to him that I thought that the key step here was requiring disclosure of the spending of money in politics because traditionally it is that sort of uh, spotlight that has led to further changes. And Larry very graciously said, I'll come. But I have to tell you, I think you're wrong. <laughs> it's too small bore. You can't just look at disclosure, you have to look at more. And I think the fact that we're sitting here together today says that we both heard each other, uh, that there are things we can do right now. There are things that could be done in the next weeks. There are things that are going to take years. So we need to see this as a collaborative process. Uh, and it's for that reason that I was delighted to be asked uh, by a group uh, used to be called United Republic. It's now called Represent Us you have the flyer on your chair, to work with them, my role was to be the lawyer working to draft the American Anti-Corruption Act with, with a team of lawyers. Uh, we sought Larry's advice. He's been involved in it. We sought the advice of a range of, of constitutional scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a website. Uh, it's, I think they have several websites, but represent uh, us is, is uh, one of them on the flyer, and I think the other one is the anticorruptionact.org. Uh, if you go to that website, you'll not only see the full proposal, uh, and I, we do not have time to go through uh, whatever it is, about uh, 15 pages of legalese on the full proposal, <laughs> uh, but you'll also see another document uh, that I think shows how seriously we've taken these issues, and that is an explanation piece by piece by piece of why we think this is constitutional. And, and again, to go back to that, uh, as we talk about the need for a constitutional amendment which would change the entire landscape, we have to recognize that that is a long process. The point of the American Anti-Corruption Act was to show that it is possible to change the process in really significant ways that would revolutionize Washington now without having to get all those states. That's not to say we shouldn't be looking at the amendment and working to the amendment, and I thought there were very good points made this morning about how the outside pressure for an amendment and for a convention leads Congress then to make changes they wouldn't otherwise lead. But to say there are, in fact, a lot of things we can do, realistically perhaps more than Congress will ever do, but that could be done constitutionally if we had enough pressure on Congress and, and the will to do it. So we set out to draft a very ambitious act that covered a whole, really put in one place the range of reforms that we think uh, would change Washington. Uh, the pe people who have been working on this have uh, support from uh, some Tea Party folks, from some Occupy Wall Street folks, from some convicted felons. Uh, <laughs> That, that would be Jack Abramoff, who, <laughs> who basically says, stop me before I kill or lobby again. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's important, because Jack can say, look, I know how it's done. <coughs> and when we were talking about the drafting, he could say, that doesn't go far enough, because I can figure out how to get around that. <laughs> so, with all of that background, let me outline uh, briefly what the provisions are so you understand the scope, and again, you can always go and, and, and take a look at it in some detail. But the first is what we're calling conflict of interest because the Supreme Court has recognized, Congress recognizes that there is a power in the legislature to prevent conflicts of interest. 
And the conflict of interest we have, as Professor Lessig outlined in some length this morning, is between the people who are giving the money, lobbying Congress, hiring lobbyists to lobby Congress, all for specific legislative action or inaction, the protection of tax preferences and loopholes and so forth, on the one hand, and the member of Congress on the other, who is dependent on that money to run his or her reelection campaign, but is sitting there voting on the bills. And whether you look at it as a shakedown by the member or an attempt to buy results by the lobbyists and the outsiders, you end up with the same place, which is they're dependent on those lobbyists and that world and the people who hire the lobbyists rather than everyone else. So the first provision in the conflict of interest says members can't raise funds from people who are lobbying them because they want something in their official capacity. So you say, fine, you can do them a favor, but then you can't ask them for money. Secondly, the lobbyists can give only a small amount to protect their First Amendment expression rights to the members, $500, and they can't solicit money for the member from everyone else. They can't bundle money for the member, and the people who have hired them can't do so either. So you're, again, separating the, this conflict of interest and trying to ensure that the people who are voting in committee on specific bills are not doing so because the lobbyist is holding a fundraiser for them next week, or the other side of that coin. You know, I, 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 as a Washington lawyer, have clients who say, I went to see a member, I wanted to explain why I hoped they'd support my bill, I had good reasons, we had a good meeting, and the next day I got a call from their fundraiser saying, would I like to be on the host committee for the fundraiser they're holding next week? That, you know, that sort of shakedown is prohibited by this. Uh, so we moved to close the revolving door. I had not heard Larry's numbers before today about the 50% of uh, senators and 42% of members of the House who then go on to be lobbyists. Um, but it's important that that not be the next meal ticket. So we extend a lot the prohibitions on uh, doing any lobbying if you're a former member for five years, which we think is a really solid time to ensure that those people have gone off and done something different and perhaps productive after Congress. <laughs> I, I would say in passing, you know, I, I'm not that old, and I can remember a time in Washington where members of Congress wanted to be members of Congress, and only when they were defeated did they say, well, now what am I going to do? I'm going to be, I guess I'll be a lobbyist because those, you know, that's who will hire me, those are the people I know. Now, Almost every session of Congress, you have members of Congress walking out their office doors and turning the keys over and saying, I'm going to be a lobbyist because I got a better offer. That, you know, it didn't used to happen that way, and it, this will ensure it doesn't. Um, next, from the lobbying conflict of interest side, we move to campaign finance, which uh, Larry has highlighted. The big change here is to say that we want an alternative method for everybody in this room to be involved. The, the numbers that you heard this morning are pretty startling. Uh, it's one-third of 1% 1 of all Americans who give enough money, $200, to a candidate, a party committee, uh, or uh, a political committee to even be listed at the FEC as a donor. One-third of 1%. One so the other 99 and two-thirds percents get covered by this proposal. And Part of this whole uh, American Anti-Corruption Act is designed to do the cross-party work uh, that Larry was referring to this morning. Um, we have had Republicans in this. We had on the conference call announcing this uh, somebody who was the ethics officer for the George W. Bush White House. He is a conservative libertarian Republican. His view is, I'm a Republican. I don't like paying taxes, I don't like huge government deficits, and I think we're getting it because of the current system. The insiders are buying everything they want, and I'm left out. So he has been one of the people pushing a proposal which he would describe from a conservative Republican side as a tax rebate. What he says is everyone pays taxes, whether it's income tax or a gas tax or a social security tax or something, we're all, actually, 
uh, one way or another paying for this government, and we all ought to get $100 back a year of our money, which we can then designate through the U.S. Treasury to one or more candidates, party committees, political committees. So we get our money back and we turn around and we fund the voices we want to fund. Uh, and that would provide an enormous pool of money outside of the traditional system. Uh, as Larry says, there are a number of good proposals that look at matching funds and everything else, but what we were looking for here is to say, here's sort of the gold standard. If we could get here, this changes the system more than anything else, and, and, I, and I think it does. Uh, beyond that, we do have disclosure in there and full transparency uh, on a range of issues. First, the whole lobbying world in Washington. There are plenty of people who leave Congress now. The next day, they turn up at a lobbying firm. They might be a former member. They are prohibited under the current law from lobbying for that first year, so they're not a lobbyist. They don't register. They're a consultant. They run the lobbying campaign. They are hired to advise on how to make this happen, but they don't actually go to the Hill and speak to someone. So we do a broad, require broader transparency with uh, people who run lobbying campaigns, people who advise on lobbying campaigns, people who are paid to help the lobbying campaign having to be disclosed so we know who they are. Uh, in addition to that, of course, uh, this includes the Disclose Act, and a point uh, on the panel that uh, was made this morning is that the important thing here is to require disclosure of money that is spent in elections. Whether it's by a C4 or a C6, it really shouldn't matter. Those are, those are more complicated questions we'll get to in a moment, but for the purposes of the American Anti-Corruption Act, let's say if you're running ads featuring members of Congress or their opponents, uh, in an election season, you should be disclosing where your money comes from, whoever you are. And you can do that constitutionally under Citizens United. So this act includes that as well. Uh, finally, the enforcement side uh, is included in this. Uh, we do have a federal election commission. Uh, it is currently a, well, let's see, highly ineffective would be understating it um, <laughs> you know, as an ex-commissioner. Uh, that commission can be improved. Um, instead of trying to micromanage what this act says is, we're going to make one key change right now, which is we're going to provide a tie-breaking vote, because believe it or not, the commission at the moment has six commissioners. It requires four to do anything and it has three Republicans and three Democrats. <laughs> and for the last couple of years, anything important has deadlocked 3-3, three, three, which means it can't act. So it provides as a stopgap that there be a seventh commissioner to break ties. But then it says we need to redesign this whole system, and it provides a mechanism for doing that. So that's the American Anti-Corruption Act. I think those key principles, the lobbying uh, conflict of interest provision, the taxpayer rebate and significant funds available for candidates, uh, the transparency and correcting the enforcement side really would change the way Washington works. Now, I think I have another couple minutes, and so I'm going to switch to, all right, I'm going to be e even more immediate. The American Anti-Corruption Act has not yet been introduced in Congress. The plan of its sponsors is to build a national constituency for it first, get people to talk about these issues, get a million signatures urging Congress to enact it, and then have members introduce it and fight it from there. So this is not going to happen tomorrow. This panel says, well, what are our alternatives from a constitutional amendment to the American Anti-Corruption Act to tomorrow? And the answer is, there are some things that could be done in the months ahead. And I want to quickly go through them. Some of them have been discussed uh, on the panels this morning, so I'll just put them in their context. I would start with that Federal Election Commission that doesn't work. There are currently five vacancies among six commissioners. <laughs> what that means is the law says the commissioners hold over. They stay there until either they die or their successors are qualified. And that means the president has to nominate someone, the Senate has to confirm them for the successors to appear. President Obama has no nominees before Congress for any of those five vacancies. 
Now, I presume he's aware of the existence of the Federal Election Commission. <laughs> the problem is he's got the same partisan divide in Congress, uh, and the Republican leadership has said to him, three of those seats are ours, thank you very much. You don't nominate. We tell you the names, and then you give them back to us, and we confirm them. And the Democratic leaders say, that's how it works for us, too. Uh, we'll confer with you, but we're going to agree on who the Democrats are. The Republicans are going to tell you who the Republicans are. Then you are going to nominate them. They're going to come in as a package, and we will bless them. Well, the Constitution wasn't actually written that way for all those people who believe in strict constructionism. It says the president nominates, the Senate advises, and confirms. So what I would recommend here is that the White House get off the stick and figure out who it wants to nominate. To try to do something on a cross-partisan basis and to avoid the partisan gridlock we have, because you right now can hear uh, Mitch McConnell saying, those are Democratic nominees, those are you know, Democrats in wolf's clothing, et cetera, and um, I'm not, you know, we're not going to confirm them. Uh, why not have the president pull together a nonpartisan, bipartisan, cross-partisan group of distinguished Americans, judges, prosecutors, state election people, and say, Give me some names. I, you know, Congress used to give me the names, and I had no choice politically. I'm asking you, Americans, to give me some names. And you give me a list of five, and I promise constitutionally I will nominate those five. And I'm going to turn around to the Senate and say, if you don't like them, you can tell the public exactly what's wrong with them. Otherwise, confirm them. That would, I think, be a real step in cross-partisanship here, and it would break the deadlock we have at the FEC. Uh, for those of you who would like to see that spelled out in more detail, I spent this week uh, struggling to write an op-ed for the Washington Post, which is in tomorrow's edition and on their website, which goes on to explain you know, what's going on at the commission and how this w would really make a difference. So I, I think we could start with the Federal Election Commission. Beyond that, we've discussed the IRS a bit today. Um, the, the IRS is not deadlocked because it has one commissioner but it is desperately trying to hide from this discussion. Uh, and, and I don't blame them. Uh, they get complaints, oh, about once a week from various groups saying, you know, that C4 and this C4 are violating the law. And they uh, at one stage wrote a letter back uh, to Democracy 21. And the letter said, we've, we've got all your complaints, and we want to assure you we're thinking about them. <laughs> we're aware of the issue. Well. You might have thought that was milk toast, but to the Republicans in Congress, that was a bomb. They were horrified. And they wrote a letter back to the IRS that said, don't you dare think about this. <laughs> Seriously. They said this is an important partisan issue, and you have to stay out of it. So the IRS could do uh, a number of things, as was laid out on the panel before, such as figuring out and being really clear about when these nonprofits are really political organizations, because if they're political organizations under the IRS rules, they're already required to disclose their donors or pay a substantial tax, uh, and figure out under what circumstances they're political organizations, what the major purpose test is, uh, and, and move from there. So that could be done by the IRS itself, which is, the last time I looked, part of the administration. The president isn't going to play politics with the IRS, but I think he could say, uh, this is an important issue, and I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you to do something. So we have that. The Securities and Exchange Commission. We've heard there are proposals before it now. Uh, they haven't done anything yet. There, that would deal with the specific issue of the transparency of uh, political expenditures by corporations. I don't believe that rulemaking uh, currently includes the possibility, under, as the British do, of requiring shareholder approval of a budget or some form of approval of political spending, uh, but that would be worth looking at. Uh, there was a reference in the panel this morning uh, to the possibility of doing uh, similar action through the states. Uh, you may have followed it, uh, Connecticut. The legislature there actually managed to pass a law uh, that said that corporations either incorporated in the state of Connecticut or doing business in the state of Connecticut, which would be most major corporations in the United States, have to get advanced shareholder approval before spending a certain level of money. Now, that was vetoed by the governor, 
uh, the Democratic governor on the basis that corporations didn't like it. Um, <laughs> but if this is a national movement, if that's the sort of thing that can be pushed across the country, uh, you might find governors of both parties uh, less inclined to veto it. So those are the sorts of things that I think can be done in the short term. Uh, I'd, I'd like to end on looking at, at Citizens United, since this is to some extent how we all got in this room, and saying there are two things in Citizens United that have not worked out the way the court said they would. One is these and this spending is not wholly, totally, truly, the three words that are there, independent of candidates and party committees. <laughs> but what that means is that it's not protected by Citizens United. It doesn't have a constitutional right to be unlimited if it is not independent. So what we can do here constitutionally without changing the court is ensure that there are standards for the independence of this spending. That could be done by the Federal Election Commission, the newly reconstituted with five new commissioner Federal Election Commission, tomorrow. It's, they, they have the statutory authority to write those regs. It's a long story, but they've actually twice wrote bad regs. They were sued. The courts agreed that they were bad and, and not extensive enough, and they wrote, went back and wrote a third bad one, which we're now living under. But a good FEC could fix that. The other area is disclosure. Uh, as you heard this morning, Citizens United has one bright spot. 8-1, the court says, full disclosure of campaign spending, election spending is constitutional. Not only that, but Justice Kennedy goes on to say it's a great thing. If you read his opinion, he says, for all of you who are worried about Citizens United and allowing corporate spending, you don't need to worry because it's going to be disclosed through the magic of something <laughs> called the Internet. <laughs> Everyone's going to know where the money is coming from. Corporate shareholders can hold their, corpor their uh, corporations responsible, and average voters are going to know who is speaking, who is funding the ads. They can make their decisions not only about what they think of the ad based on that, but then they can hold the office holders accountable and see if they're corrupted by all that spending. Well, you can't do that if it's secret. The FEC could, again, write a regulation that required it because the McCain-Feingold law, those of us who worked on it thought, did require full disclosure of spending. It says that in the law. <laughs> The FEC changed that in a regulation so that you now have this enormous loophole, and if you don't designate your contribution for uh, this particular advertising, then it isn't required. And that could be fixed by a newly reconstituted FEC. So conclusion, yes, we need to look at the long-term constitutional options. Yes, I believe we need to look at the medium-term legislative options like the American Anti-Corruption Act. But we can also do some of these smaller bore things that would actually make a difference, and we can push those now. Thanks. Uh, I found out some shocking things in there. Um, it turns out President Obama is not strongly challenging Republicans. I did not see that coming. <laughs> not doing much about the FEC and campaign finance reform? Obama? Huh, shocking. Uh, now, to, to that point, I just want to emphasize this point. Um, two points, actually. Look, uh, this money that goes into campaigns it does something really interesting that I don't think uh, a lot of people talk about. It not only gets the people who get the money to be elected and hence presents that bias, which we've all talked about, but it also has a secondary bias, which is that it go flows towards really strong Republicans that ask for the moon and really weak Democrats that say, all right, thank you, sir, may we have another. So if you're a strong Democrat, as Howard Dean was in 2004, you are not going to get that money, okay? If you're a corporatist Democrat that says, well, we can make a compromise. For example, instead of having six people on the FEC, we'll just have one. <laughs> then you get the money. And don't forget, President Obama raised a billion dollars. And some of that was small money, but a lot of it was really large money. So is it surprising that the guy who raised a billion dollars is not really that interested in fixing a system that got him elected president of the United States twice. 
So my point there isn't that you should be opposed to President Obama or Democrats. It's that when they ask you to clap louder as a solution to, hey, how are we going to fix this system, don't believe them. They are part of the insiders. They're not part of the outsiders. Uh, now, 